Hello and welcome back to Elden Ring Ultimate Guide. Today it's part 41, which is Moog's Palace. But just quickly, we're at the impassable Great Bridge, Great Bridge Grace, and um, we are slaughtering a couple of... Uh, I mean, they're not penguins, but they're some kind of animal, because they drop an item called Flight Pinion, right? And in Moog, in Moog's Palace, there is a bunch of giant zombie uh, crows, very akin to the ones in Caelid, that are an extreme, unbelievable pain in the fucking arse. But we have devised a devilish method for getting around this problem, and it involves using sleep arrows. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off this episode by crafting an amount of sleep arrows. Now, you don't need the flight pinions. The flight pinions are just for making better arrows. But if you go to this tree here in Village of the Alban Oryx, there's a whole bunch of Trina's lilies. Now, you might not have picked these lilies up, but this is a great way of just getting all the Trina's lilies we would need for this part because there's so many in this one area. So... You might have an amount of Trina's Lilies if you have already picked them up from this part and you've already used them, then I'd suggest go about and try and find some more. But otherwise, we can find all the beast bones we need from the twin maiden husks in the round table. And thus, that will give us access to all the sleep arrows that we need. If for whatever reason you are lacking Trina's Lilies, and um, there are a bunch scattered around in the world, um... Heading out to the coastal cave for... I believe we're coming here to get a short bow so that we can use the barrage ash of war and sleep enemies much, much quicker. Those crows included. But um, no, if yes. you're lacking... If you're lacking Trina's lilies for whatever reason, there are a couple of merchants that sell them. The two that immediately come to mind are the merchant in the Mistwood um, in the eastern half of Limgrave and the merchant on the... Grand staircase that leads you up to the Ray Lucaria Academy. So once you take that uh, blue seal, you'll already have Ray Lucaria Academy unlocked. But once you take that blue seal, turn around and head back down the path that you came up, and you will uh, no doubt find the merchant who also sells Trina's lilies and some uh, St. Trina's arrows. But we came back to the apostate derelict. We're retracing our steps past the rune bears jumping over back to the Sending Gate that we actually took in the last episode in Snowfield 2. Just showing you how to get here once again. Um, you could have also used the Pure Blood Knight's Medal, but it actually puts you in a slightly different spot in Mog's Palace um, that pretty much skips out the Blood Swamp, which is not ideal for guide purposes, which is why we didn't do it that way around. Yes. Uh... Remember, we get we get that uh, the medal from doing Vare's quest. So, strictly speaking, uh, you could just use that medal and then just find your way to this place without picking anything up and then kind of start from here. But, strictly speaking, this is the point in the game where you want to be doing Moog's Palace, and that is when it presents you with it, which is in the snowfield. So, now we've got all the stuff we need. We're building uh, some uh, Sleep Bone Arrows fletched, and we've got the ability to make a fair, fair amount of them. And now we will uh, put the barrage Ash of War on the short bow, and this way we can just fire off like in very quick succession a lot of sleep build up just using the arrows. Not only this, we are putting um, Storm Collar on our uh, our Great Stars as well as Wild Strikes because we need those two for the upcoming area because there's a bunch of NPCs we need to fight as well. And then we're switching the bow out for the short bow which has barrage, and. If you've came here before, you'll know that these uh, these crows are an, a massive, massive, massive pain in the ass, and um, we've devised a great way of actually fighting them. Because strictly speaking, if you are doing this area, it's quite difficult to avoid fighting them entirely. So here we are. We're showing you the best farming method in the game. We did show you this in the snowfield uh, part, but you can just use one arrow, and you can shoot that crow. Over and over and over again, shoot it, rest, shoot it, rest, and you can farm souls that way. But we're just not avoiding all the... Oh, sorry, go on. I was going to say, not only that, but since that's the path we'll be taking first, doing that as soon as you stand up from the grace means that you don't have to fight the crow in this little area here that we're about to drop down into. Yes, so shooting that wasn't even necessarily part of a demonstration. It's more of a, that is actually how you tackle one of the crows in this area, is by shooting it um, to make it fall off the cliff edge. That way you don't need to fight it here. Because there is an NPC fight here, 
when in, again fighting these big crows are quite tough but you'd have to fight the crow in order to fight the npc so yeah um it's uh kind of mandatory so we're putting on the i think that was the immunizing horn one of the horn charms the ones that increase your bleeding frost resistance and uh, right about now the npc should show up so when we pick up the blood rose we're going to put blood flame blame blood flame blade on our great stars and then uh, just start spamming wild strikes because this is the method for killing NPCs. Your reward for killing the white mask is the full war surgeon set, which comes with the white mask, which has an effect similar to the Lord of Blood's exaltation in that it boosts your attack power when there's blood loss in the vicinity. But now we need to talk about the method for dealing with these crows. Yeah, so we've got our barrage with we've got a barrage short bow on, and we've got our sleep arrows equipped. And all we're doing is we are just spamming the absolute shit out of this thing with the barrage arrows. Now you might be thinking, why not use the sleep pots? But the sleep pots we found were actually a lot harder to get this thing slept because they move about in quite large distances. So they might get initially a little bit affected by sleep, but it wasn't enough to actually like put it to sleep fully. But when it's asleep, we're going to put uh, Blood Flame Blade on our Great Stars and then we're going to use Stormcaller. And... Um, now, what Stormcaller should have done is knock it down, but it didn't, it didn't stagger it or stun it, whatever you want to call it. But it is very, very effective, putting a lot of damage into it. So this was absolutely the best method that we could find for killing these crows. Um, now, like, sure, you could just bang your head against the crow and just hit it and heal a whole bunch and, you know, kill it sloppily. But if you want an elegant solution, I would certainly think this is probably much the most elegant solution that we could find. Um, obviously, you can just keep backing off as you're shooting this thing with the arrows and it will get put to sleep there you go i think i think it was about six or seven arrows was enough to put it to sleep obviously you're going to miss some of them generally speaking but you want to get right in nice and close to it and then just spam that fucking storm collar and this should knock it down and then when it's knocked down you want to spam storm collar again when it's on the ground and there you go nice and fucking easy there will never be a pain yeah ever again absolutely painless or at least relatively painless when compared to fighting them straight up but we picked up the halig drake talisman plus two we did um in this area which is one of the key components for absolutely rinsing the last boss um it is. yeah yeah so it's, <laughs> it's it's definitely worthwhile picking up i think we also picked up a stone sword key as well yeah i don't think we'll be needing many more of them at this point and there's only a couple more stone sword key dolls and i imagine we already have a surplus but if you are lacking one and for whatever reason you think mogwin's palace is the place to search for a spare uh, <laughs> that's where to pick one up uh yeah th so just to make a point you want to kill all the dogs on that platform first before baiting this thing over with an arrow you do not want to get uh, ganged up on especially by dogs in this area because they can inflict quite a lot of bleed so again this thing's it's this thing's been put to sleep and then, what do we do? We spam Stormcaller straight into its dick. I do just want to say, actually, on the on the topic of dealing with the crows in this way, um, be careful when you're applying the sleep with Barrage, because if you hit them with a single arrow on top of what you needed to put them to sleep, it will interrupt the sleep. Yeah, so, so just it be will careful. just negate it. So, yeah, once you figure out how many it takes to sleep it, Fire that many off and that many alone. Um, don't keep spamming because you will just cost yourself the win against them. The cool news is, is that Stormcaller is like it's pretty usable to begin with. So, you know, you're not really losing out much by not having Lion's Claw, which surprisingly was not the best thing for fighting these guys. Uh, one of the few instances in the game where Lion's Claw just wasn't straight up the best option. And we tried so many different methods for trying to kill these uh these crows elegantly so we picked yeah, up our we 13 there earthshaker we tried waves of darkness we tried uh storm call the ground slam uh lion's claw and everything we tried even wild strikes after putting it to sleep wasn't as good as storm caller because it nah. didn't hit as quickly as storm caller and that was the critical thing for getting the getting the one over on them Getting the yeah. one up on them, sorry. Because you want to hit, hit them, do damage, but also you want to inflict bleed and then also knock them over. So as you saw, we killed another white mask there. We didn't get anything for that one. And picking up the clarifying bosses. 
Uh, but now there is the last white mask to kill. So as you can see, like, killing the crows is actually, like, basically mandatory in order to kill the white masks. Because you you want, you want don't want to be fighting these things off a giant crows attacking you. So it's, uh, yeah, necessary, sadly. But with this method, not a big deal. And with that white mask dead, that's the last of them. And that has, I believe triggered Vare's quest to continue, which is a little bit further on in Mogwin Palace proper. Yeah, I was going to say, I have a feeling that actually killing the White Mask is mandatory for, for Vare's quest, so, yeah. Now, here we've got to fight a bunch of Elven Eryx that for some reason can inflict Frostbite, um, <laughs> despite being in the blood area, but... They, they can inflict bleed as well, I think. But... Oh, they can, yeah. Um... So, there's a Bunch of Albanorix in this area. Luckily, Stormcaller actually kind of puts in the work uh, if, in case you're getting ganged up on. It's actually pretty good in that sense. Um, but you want to be... Uh, please trust me with this. You want to be extra fucking careful because the, you can get seriously ganged up on in this area and they can just fucking kill you. So keep an eye on your health. And, uh, yeah. Luckily, you have Stormcaller if you do get backed into a corner. It is pretty good, but... So it's not. It's not a completely just win the situation button, because uh, it doesn't. It doesn't automatically kill them in one combo. So, <laughs> no, that is true. Although you are seeing something that Stormcaller does quite well, especially on the Great Stars, is because of that one percent health back per hit, Stormhall, uh, Stormcaller can hit six times. So if you can successfully land a full Stormcaller on one of these enemies, it will give you six percent of your HP back. Yes, is that good. is true. If you have the other Stormcaller out, you'll get 2% of your HP back. And then also, if you're hitting multiple enemies with that Stormcaller, you'll get even more HP back. True, yeah. All of these things do stack to give you some pretty substantial... <laughs> some pretty substantial healing. I love the Mimic just jumping in again like fucking Batman, swooping in and finishing him off. Bro, that Mimic just killed one of them. Fucking well in. Now, uh, so now we're, as we're just like, you know, taking care of these Auburn Oryx, which... Sadly, running past them isn't really an option. Um, you don't, because obviously, if we're going to pick up some items and stuff, you do not want to get, you know, 15 Auburn Oryx just follow you into this cave. Do you know what I mean? So just be, be aware. Uh, in this yeah, cave, we've got Blood Tax <laughs> and we've got a Somber Smith and Stone 9. That would be what you'd call suboptimal. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Blood uh, Tax is. Fine as an Ash of War, by the way. It's effectively repeating thrust, but it gives you HP back every time you hit something. Yes. Um, it's pretty good. Uh, so, yeah, into this cave with even more Albin Oryx. Now, these are second generation Albin Oryx, and they can uh, drop the Dirty Chainmail, Curved Club, Curved Great Club, the Ripple Crescent Halberd, the Albin Oryx Shield. Uh, we've already got the headpiece that you get from uh, Volcano Manor. And despite the fact that some of them were wield the Ripple Blade or the Shamshir, they don't drop either of those things. We've already got the Shamshir, you pick it up in Limgrave, and you get the Ripple Blade from Pidia, I'm sure. Yeah, well remembered. So here we go, just spamming some more Stormcaller. It's actually, I will say, uh, Stormcaller is quite uh, satisfying to use. Yeah, one of my favourite Ashes. To be sure, I like the amount of space it gives you. I like the fact that it's multiple hits. It does good poise damage. It's good if you've got status effects on your weapons. It's just all round dependable ash, um, along the lines of ground slam or lion's claw. So we're not going to fight these Auburn Oryx because finally we can just make a just do a one run around the tree, pick up the three items. <sighs> God, that's so frust frustrating. Even watch what just happened there. But yeah, um, just grab the items and then just fucking. Get the fuck out of there. I'm going to assume maybe I quit in, quit out. I do. Yeah, so I, I, ju so. I just quit out, load back in, that'll reset their position in aggro, and then we can just continue on. So now we're again, we're holding this uh, right hand wall here and then heading around this tree. Now, what's about to come up is a gigantic pain in the ass. Uh, you might want to use Assassin's Gambit for this part, uh, but these guys here will, like, immediately summon a giant fucking skeleton to attack you. Um, ugh, it's so frustrating, so you really want to... Look, see, as you saw there, right, even Stormcaller, it can summon the skeleton so quickly, it can summon it between Stormcaller hits. 
So yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's it's like a start up to its summon a skeleton attack is basically uninterruptible. Um, if anybody has a way of dealing with them where they do not summon the skeleton whatsoever, then please stick it in the comments. But otherwise, you want to sneak up on that one and kill it as quickly as possible. That way the skeleton doesn't stick about for as long. But uh, we picked up a couple items that were uh, in front of it. And we are again uh, trying to look out for the, the other summoner. There he is there. So we're just, fuck it. We're just going to run straight to the to the next grace. And then we'll, we'll head back. So, there's, so that was three summoners in that area. But the grace is right here. So we're just going to grab the grace. Make a suicide run from the grace to get the items. No, apparently we don't grab the grace. I don't know why I didn't. But yeah, just run in, grab the nascent butterfly, grab the sacramental bud, and I'm pretty sure there is still another item to get. Yeah, I think if memory serves, it's a golden rune of some kind. If memory serves, it's literally not even... Yeah, it is a golden rune, I'm pretty sure. But uh, if memory actually serves, just don't even really bother going back into that bit of forest because getting three massive skeletons that I think fire a, just a giant beam of energy at you is just not worth it. Obviously, we're going to show you because that's what we have to do, but the items in that little bit of forest are just not worth the effort, like, seriously. So, I recommend just avoiding it entirely. Uh, here we go. We put, I think we put on Assassin's Gambit now, which admittedly does do a fairly good job at them not noticing you, but it might just be because of the angle that we're coming in from. So, perhaps if you put Assassin's Dagger on coming from the other way, you'll have an easier time. But, obviously, if they do see you, they're still going to summon the skeleton. Yeah, it's, it's pretty hard to efficiently tell you where things are in this area in terms of these item pickups. But as you can yeah. see, we're sort of hogging the wall on our right there, scanning around to see if we can find where the item was. It's hidden in a bush. It was a fucking golden rune. I knew it was. Um, But once we've grabbed that, we are just getting the fuck out of Dodge and it's time to do Mogwin Palace proper. Yes, uh, not only that, the Golden Rune was directly in front of one of the Alban Oryx, so you'd have to still attack that Alban Oryx to kill it, but the problem is, is that it can still just summon the skeleton in between your attacks anyway, so just grab the item and run, like it's not going to make a difference. So yeah, now we're just uh, putting uh, Golden Vow back on, putting our normal bow back on. We are changing this, which, again, having your uh, the Stalwart Horm channel, charm on isn't actually a bad idea for Moog's Palace. Uh, I think now we just a uh, little bit of an edit, but we're putting Lion's Claw back on as well. Then we keep Wild Strikes on because, again, uh, we are going to fight an NPC coming up, so useful. These so putrid corpses in this area, um, some of them will bloat and sprint towards you, and this will build up bleed. As, as they run past you even, they don't even actually have to touch you. You are just going to ignore these enemies. Don't fight them, don't try and kill them, because when they explode, and they do after they die, it puts a cloud of bleed build up for gas everywhere. This giant blood clot looking thing, just come to the left hand side and jump around it. Don't yeah. fight it. Um, don't fight any of these things, because honestly, the more of them you kill, the harder this is. Yeah. It's really, it's not a fun time when your enemies just explode in a cloud of microscopic razor blades. So yeah, just, just avoid that scenario <laughs> entirely. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's very be... easy to just avoid them anyway. So it's kind of, it's not the biggest deal. Yeah, the fucking fiberglass cloud they release. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Breathing in literal knives. Um, so in this dark so... area, you can actually summon the mimic. Um, I would highly advise doing that because you are going to get accosted by sanguine noble enemies. Not the invaders, the actual enemies. You'll see them appear out of the ground like so. Uh, they can put this blood puddle on the ground. It makes them a pain in the ass to fight because that puddle will, much like the cloud, just build up passive bleed while you're standing in it and slow unless, your movement. Unless you are in the middle of reposting it, in which case you don't get any bleed build up. So... <laughs> Fuck it. Yeah, true. Um, uh, this is the final uh, merchant in the game, I believe. Um, he's very isolated, um, and he sells infinite bleed bolts. So if you're using the three-round burst crossbow, that's where you get the bleed ammunition for it. Grabbing a Lord's Rune there, and one of the final glove wart in this area. Big one, great, great, uh, great ghost glove wart. 
And that is one of the merchants that I would highly recommend killing and putting his soul inside the Twin Maiden husks. Because you don't yeah. want to have to deal with fucking sanguine nobles every time you want some extra bolts. That Just actually kill does... him there yeah. and put his soul in the round table. I have a feeling that maybe having the option to buy the, the Bell Baron off him for like an extremely, like maybe like double the value of everything that he's holding would have been like a, a nicer option that way you don't need to kill any of them. Yeah, I guess. Um, I have a feeling that because of merchants like that, they made killing them come with no penalty. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So, um, now we're, we've picked up the last items in that area, we're right at the grace, and now we get to finish Vare's quest, which just involves killing him, ultimately. Um, I think his summon sign is like just at the doorway there, so we've ran past yeah. it. Yeah. But now we're going to rest yeah, in yeah. grace and then we'll take care of him. Um, as you might expect, he's an NPC, and what do we do to NPCs? Wild strikes. That's right, boys and girls, we wild strikes them. Especially with Bloodflame Blade on, because fuck him. Um, uh, he's just off this cliff edge beneath you here. Um, as soon as he spots you, we'll start talking shit. There you go. Um, oh, just How did you get up there? Each other. I have no idea. NPCs have superpowers, I guess, but... He's wielding a bouquet of flowers, and we have a giant pointy <laughs> stick that's on fire, so... Yeah. Um, he didn't really stand a chance. You get a rune arc and a fur, a fur calling finger remedy, but that's because you invaded and killed somebody. And then he's dying here on the floor. Um, almost missed him. Almost but missed your, him, yeah. Your reward, your reward for doing this is the bouquet of flowers. It's terrible. Yeah, I think, actually, statistically speaking, it is the weakest weapon in the entire game. It's only for building up bleed. And that said, though, now what we're going to be doing is swapping out one of the tiers in the Physic Flask for the Purifying Crystal tier that we picked up in the Altus Plateau. As part of Eura's quest, we defeated Eleonora, and your reward was that and the Pearl Blade. And that mitigates Moog's, what I'll call Moog's deadliest attack. He also does a lot of fire damage, hence the need for the... Uh, Flame Drake Talisman and the Staunching Boluses are to mitigate bleed. We're putting on the um, Moog Shackle because that will come in handy for stunning him in his first phase. We also have the Uplifting Aromatic that the Mimic can use to give itself a bubble tier and us if we're standing close enough to it. But before we actually go take on the boss, the fucking child predator living up there on the hill, it's time to pick up the last remaining item in this area, which if you come behind these pillars... You piss off the Sanguine Noble. Oh, the the second to last item is behind the pillars. But you piss off the Sanguine Noble that was standing in front of this box, gives you free access to the box, and then you can immediately run past all of these enemies. Fuck them. Don't fight them. It's a waste of time. This is probably the hardest encounter in the entire area. Run to the lift, get on it, and you're safe. You're good to go. Now it's time for the boss. Now, the boss is actually... In my opinion, easier than the first Moog fight. Um, this Moog can actually be bled. And at this point, we are now like so well positioned in terms of our overall damage and level that you're just going to see. Like, it's all. Like, as long as you've been following what we've been doing, if you're even close to how strong we are, you just summon the Mimic, put on the Physic Flask, and like the amount of damage that you do to this guy just from like. Wild Strikes or Lion's Claw or whatever the fuck. It's just, it's just kind of crazy, to be honest. Now, the uh, Purifying Crystal tier, you get to use, um, and it will mitigate his... Uh, it's an attack that ble like inflicts bleed three times in a row and then also heals him, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll call it the Countdown. He'll start counting backwards in Latin. And when he does that... Um... He gets to zero, says zero three times, and every time he says zero, he just uh, bleeds. So he's counting down, counting down, and here it comes. This. Healed a bit, healed a bit more, healed a third time. Now, if we didn't have Purifying Crystal Tear on, that would have done a fuckload of damage. It would have bled you three times. You'd have had to basically spend three flasks to survive it. Um... But you're, you're getting case in point here for why this Moog is arguably easier than Sewer Moog. Because we have done a 
frankly stupid amount of damage to Moog with uh, bleed. Yeah. Now, Why just the water point can bleed? No idea. I know. I know. Now, just to make a point, I'm actually actively not being aggressive towards this boss, uh, simply to show off its move set and like just kind of how easy it is and how survivable it is. Um, if I was even slightly more aggressive, this thing would probably have died long ago. I do have more footage as well, so there's a second fight for this. Um, I've seen people say they struggle with this boss. I really, particularly with this build, I really do not know how you could ever struggle. Just jump in L1s with a Mimic tier, uh, like Lion's Claw with a Mimic tier. You can even put your own Blood Flame Blade on because, again, this guy can bleed. So I just, it's really not a boss that should ever cause you any kind of issues, to be honest. Particularly if you've got the charm on that like increases your bleed resistance, you've got the purifying crystal tier, you can immediately hit him with a Moog shackle. As you saw, as soon as we shackled him, you and the mimic tier got him to below half health. So at that point, you can go, okay, immediately this boss has half its HP, and then I now have my entire amount of flasks left worth of healing in order to kill it. I, I, I just really don't see how you're going to struggle. He is also vulnerable during the entire countdown. Um, animation. He sort of stands still while he does it. Meaning, you have all the time in the world to finish him off. Like, if you get a shackle pop, and you deal what, half of his health before he can even do anything? Um, he started the countdown, which means the shackle no longer works, to be clear. Yeah. So, um, what I tried to do there was get its health down to maybe, like, a third and then use the shackle, because that's where you're going to get the most value out of it. But, strictly speaking, as you saw, I didn't even need the shackle in order to beat the guy. So, <laughs> uh, I, I accidentally done too much damage in order to get the free damage thing off. So, yeah, I think that kind of just highlights that uh, you're, as long as you are kind of got the setup that we've got, you're just going to have a, an easy time. Like, even if you were, like, probably 20 levels lower than what we were, you're probably still going to have an easy enough time. Particularly just with Lion's Claw spam. Obviously, avoid the... Avoid the, the passive blood flame that's floating about, because you really don't want to get bled over and over again. But as long as you're avoiding that and hitting them with as many uh, lines claws as you can get into them, you're just not going to have a particularly tough time. Because, I mean, the Mimic tier is just it's, it's, it's really putting in the work, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, the Mimic tier is... He's going to be putting in the work because he's got our build and more HP than us. So even if nothing else, the Mimic is serving as an adequate distraction. Um, because unlike um, a certain boss in a future part, this boss doesn't heal off of damaging your summons. So you can just sort of let the Mimic take care of it. Yeah, there you go. The Mimic was in fact able to take care of a significant chunk of that boss. Um... Yeah, and that's, that's Moog. Uh, I've personally never had an issue with Moog, particularly with this build. I've, I mean, I've not had an issue with most bosses because of this build specifically, actually. But, um, yeah. Uh, also, remember, we did pick up the map fragment for Moog. But now we've got Moog's rune, we can warp back to the Divine Tower of East Altus, which we've already been to, uh, and then we can... Um, we've got, I think we've got Morgoth's rune here, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So now Moog's rune will also be there. Something, something lore something something storytelling but now we've now we have been to moog's palace we can in fact talk to um uh, gideon and he will give us law of causality and the fact that we i think also uh oh no no so we also get an item off him for going to um the halig tree as well so we got fervor's cookbook for going to either Halig Tree or Mogswin's Palace. And we also got Black Flame Protection. What was that for? Fuck. So we have found Mikola as one of the unlocated demigods. We found the Lord of Blood. That's another unlocated demigod. And we found the Halig Tree. Right, yes. So that's three of his rewards. You get the fourth one from finding the last unlocated demigod, Melania. Blade of Mikola, by the way, for those who didn't know. Now, the thing is, is that we actually kill Gideon before finding Melania in this guide. But it turns out it's okay, because actually, you can still kill Gideon and get his reward for finding Melania after he's dead, because it just shows up in the Twin Maiden Husks inventory. 
So the only problem is you need to buy it instead of just get just give get given it. But in terms of the overall progression of the game, it's just it's kind of better doing it this way. Uh, so that is it for Moog's Palace. I'm pretty sure. Um, we're yeah, just, uh, just resetting the gear back to what it should be. Um, yes. Standard Talisman's Crimson Seed, the uh, Dragon Crest Shield until we get the upgrade, but that'll be it for Mogwin's Palace. And okay, there we go. That's Mogwin Palace. We're done. Join us in part 42. Where we're going to be doing Faramazula. Now, other than liking and subscribing, you can follow us on Twitter. You can also follow us on Twitch, where we will be streaming once the DLC is out. And if you're feeling especially generous, you can sling us some cash on Patreon if you're so inclined. But the best thing you can do is just comment anything. Just comment anything. Go on. Anything. Two seconds. Go on. Anyway, catch you in the next part.